So welcome very much this afternoon to the latest of NIA's Nano in Action webinar series. And today we're having a look at nano safety. It's a topic that underpins everything that we do at NIA with regards to commercial development of materials. And it was an excellent opportunity today to take a closer look at all of the research that helps drive how nano safety is converted into safe products and processes. So today I can tell you we've got four excellent speakers from within the NIA membership, because of course we would only have extremely excellent members. So we will kick start with Isabel Lynch and her team at the University of Birmingham before moving over to Nick Quirk from Imperial College London. We will move then to the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health before finishing off with uh, Vito back in Belgium. And as many of you will know, having attended our webinars before, uh, this session is being recorded and it will be available to uh, everybody on YouTube and we will send all the participants the link immediately that we have it. The slides from today will be available to members and as I've already mentioned, we keep people on mute to ensure audio quality for everybody participating plus the recording. So, as all of you also know who have attended our webinars before, there is literally no such thing as a free lunch. So, we're going to run through a few slides welcoming you to NIA and introducing you to our industry association. So, as the name might suggest, as the Nanotechnology Industries Association, we represent the development of commercial nanomaterials uh, in all aspects and all sectors across the world. And we work primarily within three areas to do this. We support the development of a very strong re regulatory framework that allows confident investment within materials. We work very hard for business, business and scientific networking for our members in particular. And we work alongside a lot of other organizations in helping to build a very coherent global nanotechnology ecosystem where research and innovation can be spread around the world with minimal financial or scientific or regulatory barriers. Just a quick look at some of our members. We have a hugely diverse range of organizations involved with NIA, as you might expect from a technology that crosses all sectors and all types of uh, applications. So from the large companies where we, you know, we welcome 3M, BSF, Solvay and Cabot, through to mid-sized companies, which are really super active on the uh, innovation side and highly diverse in their products that they develop. And these guys from Cellulforce in Canada, from to Nanoco within the UK, they work on all types of different materials and all types of different applications. And their needs from an industrial association include support and regulatory development um, and access to global connections for promotional and marketing activities. We are fortunate to have a very strong research base within the um, association also, many of whom you're going to hear from today. And these guys really bring the next generation technologies and understanding of nanomaterials and processes that support commercial development everywhere in the world. And we wouldn't be where we were today either without our specialist service provider members. So, and these guys play the pivotal role in helping small companies in particular successfully develop early stage innovations into market and they play a critical role in the commercial development uh, of nanotechnologies as a sector as a whole. And finally, we have members from other associations around the world as well and um, we work with them to amplify our services and promotion into companies in particular all around Europe and in fact globally. So our regulatory priority work is very diverse. We are often seen by our members as an external regulatory partner for them because it's an expensive and time consuming game to be on top of the regulations all the time. So we work to help support particularly our research and our small to mid sized company members in ensuring they understand the full regulatory framework around nanomaterials and are ready for changes that may come and can be gain the maximum impact for the work that they undertake. So we work across all sectors such as um, represented through agencies such as ECHA and EFSA. We work with the observatory from the European Union as an excellent neutral central point 
for information regarding nanomaterials. And anything essentially will work with all of our members on any of their regulatory inquiries that they have. On our business and scientific networking side, we run a number of different activities to ensure that members and indeed other organisations have access to the correct information all the time, uh, whether that be novel technologies or whether it be the right financial or business routes forward. So we do this particularly through we have coming up in June this year, we have our ChemSpec Nano Pavilion where we will be in Basel at Chemspec, a large specialty chemicals trade show. And the Nano Pavilion will be welcoming eight of our members there. And we will be showcasing nanomaterials and hopefully bringing in a new community to get involved in nanomaterials use and production as a result of that. We also work across a number of different um, projects. And some of them you will hear from, it will be mentioned through today. Uh, and particularly, you'll hear about the Nano Safety Cluster, which brings all of these projects together that have been funded through Horizon 2020. And of course, this presentation wouldn't be complete without a pitch for you to say, why don't you join NIA? If you're not already a member, of course you should be one. We work with all sorts of different organisations and we bring together the strengths of different people in different countries for the benefit of all other members. Hope we like to think there is no question to which we cannot find the person to provide the answer. And so, and our, hopefully our other members can tell you this already. So you can always contact us through our website and through our inquiries email address. But of course now back to the show for which you came. So looking at the importance of nano safety and in particular nano safety research, if you take a step back and say, OK, what is safety in chemicals production? Of course, it goes without saying that the aim of safety research and safety frameworks are to ensure safe products for people and the environment. And this underpins the regulatory environments in which you have in Europe and indeed other regulatory uh, territories such as the US, such as China. Uh, they will all have a different regulatory pathway for, for a product to reach market successfully. And these regulatory pathways, which really do look at the safety aspects of materials and products, these create the pathway for your industrial decision making. Because as we look at this from a near perspective, it's all about how you support a safe product successfully to market. And in looking at safety decisions, there will be a number of questions to ask. So the first one is, is my early stage innovation safe? We know that it has potential benefits, but I don't know what the hazards are, the risks are associated with that yet. How much will it cost me to demonstrate the safety or to find out the safety? This is mentioned both, measured both in time and money, because the longer it takes a product to get to market or the more expensive it is to undertake the testing, the smaller the market access you have. You cannot sell a high production volume, low cost material if it's cost you a huge amount of money to get it there you'll be looking at more expensive niche products, uh, the more expensive your material becomes. So the time and money to market makes a huge difference on whether you make it to market at all. So the producers of nanomaterials will then be asking, can I afford to actually hit my target market? Because if I can only sell it to a very small number of people with the cost associated, will I ever make my money back? And that leads you to the last question is like, do I even start this investment? If I'm confident of being able to make my money back, of taking a safe product to a recognized number of markets, both sectoral and ge geographical, then I can decide whether to actually start this process or not. So this is an age old pathway. It is not unique to nanomaterials at all. But now we look at this and we take it and we look at nanomaterials themselves. We know that they often have a different behavior because that's why they have are used at the nanoscale with that sort of different functionality that is often manifested. And of course, aside from chemicals at a larger scale, they have the potential to go further within biological systems. So these add questions that we may not have had before about other materials. And so that brings it with it both challenges and opportunities from a nano safety perspective. And around challenges, particularly from an industrial perspective, you know, it's still very much an emerging science in terms of understanding how you characterize a novel material. 
And nanomaterials exist in extremely diverse forms. You know, even amongst the same fundamental material, you have got different sizes, different shapes. Are they coated? Are they uncoated? That brings a different question to ask often around safety assessment. And themselves, they are not easy materials to assess. Their very nature, the things that give them benefit as nanomaterials, often means that they are difficult to address in a standardized way. And regulations are moving to address this. We're seeing more reference to nanomaterials within key regulations, REACH being the main one that we focus on within NIA. But of course, these are often still open to interpretation because they are new tracts of text being brought into regulatory frameworks and we are finding out how they work and how you address them. So in the safety assessment for nanomaterials, there is the potential for very significant data requirements um, and that can make it very difficult to find the time and the money and the expertise to provide that data in a way that makes you confident that your dossier will be successfully received and that you will actually reach market in a sustainable way. And so the consequence of many of these is often a re restriction of the flow of novel materials to market because there are questions that still can't be addressed fully uh, through the safety position that we have now. But of course, this also brings with it many opportunities and Europe has moved very quickly to try and capitalise on these opportunities. You know, we look at, you will hear today about predictive modelling research, which will allow the use of existing or new data to predict how your material is going to um, perform, how it can be linked to other materials that are similar, which means that you have to do less new testing yourselves. We're looking very much at how in vitro testing can replace in vivo testing. And this works in two very important ways. Obviously, you have the reduced use of animals within um, safety testing, which is an ethical target we all aspire to. And of course, it reduces the cost. If you can do something in a, in a uh, test tube rather than a rabbit, that's cheaper. And it also creates opportunities for high throughput processes because anything that speeds the process brings the cost down. And so we look at the last slide that I have as part of my introduction, and we look at how Europe has positioned itself in particular through its use of the precautionary principle. And this drives a lot of policy development within the European Union, and this has driven a lot of the nano safety research that we will look at today. So the European Union in particular has invested significantly in nano safety research, and you will hear about the nano safety cluster from one of our first presenters, the University of Birmingham. And the nano safety cluster, as you all know, brings together the major projects that have been funded within Europe to share expertise and to pool resources and hopefully accelerate the translation of research into practice. Europe also drives many international initiatives. So it has ongoing relationships with countries such as the US, areas such as China and, and wider Asia. So it's very important that we move in an aligned fashion as much as possible on nano safety research. But I'm really pleased to say, obviously, it's situated in Brussels, that the EU positions itself very strongly as a scientific leader for nano safety research. And you will see that in the projects from which you are going to hear about later. And this really allows us to capitalise on developing novel services from on a commercial perspective and looking at nanomaterials production and scale up. The European Union has programmes such as open innovation test beds, pilot plants, and this really suits its commercial niche as a high value, uh, small volume provider. And so we're pleased to see the investment that Europe has made in this and hopefully it will continue beyond Horizon 2020 and into Horizon Europe. But that is enough from me. The people you're about to hear from know vastly more than I do. So our presentations today are going to really look at what nano safety research actually covers because it's a hugely diverse um, area in its own right. We're, we're going to, you're going to see some of the projects and the scientific targets that are currently underway in some very ambitious projects indeed. And of course, this will all impact future commercial development of nanomaterials. So I will stop talking and hand over to our first presenter, who is Isolt from the University of Birmingham. And by the power, ICT power invested in me, I will start the slideshow. And welcome, Isolt. 
Perfect. Thank you very much, Claire, for the introduction and for the opportunity to present um, the University of Birmingham and our Horizon 2020 funded projects to your wider membership um, via this Nano in Action session. Um, so the photo there just shows our group as it was a couple of years ago, and it's shared or co-led by myself and my colleague Eva Balsami Jones, um, and consists of a number of fairly senior researchers, postdocs, PhD students, and always lots of visitors as well. Um, so we're the Environmental Nanosciences Group at the University of Birmingham. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so you can sort of click on again if you don't mind. So I guess these slides have some animation in them. So this is just sort of showing the campus. It's a red brick campus um, and it's in the second largest city in, in um, the UK. So it's got about 3.7 million people. Um, Tassos, one of our uh, senior researchers who helped us put together the slides, came up with the fact that it's um, got quite a, a strong musical legacy from, from UB40 to Duran Duran to Black Sabbath and the ELO um, and also has hosted J.R.R. Tolkien and who's from here and our alumni and former staff include it's actually 10 in Nobel laureates now rather than the eight there um, and then if you just click through please Um, you'll see then, uh, yes, so it's a red brick university and um, those are some of our central buildings and what that means is that it's a civic university, so it doesn't come with a, a religious past, um, which is one of the things that appeals greatly to me. Uh, it's part of the Russell Group universities, um, which are the, the elite uh, research intensive universities in the UK. Um, and it has significant scientific research strength and activity um, across a wide spectrum of nano-related areas. So uh, we have colleagues working in uh, our School of Biosciences, in medicine, in civil engineering, in chemical engineering, and so on. Um, we also have a very strong focus on big data, and the snapshot of projects there on the right-hand side shows the spectrum of um, FP7 and now Horizon 2020 projects that we've been involved in, uh, just specifically on nano safety. And then at the bottom, you can see that uh, the University of Birmingham overall has been involved in very large numbers of EU funded projects and is actually one of the, the very one of the success stories. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this just shows some of the, the range of expertise in our environmental nanoscience group. Um, so we do a lot of design and synthesis of nanomaterials, so bespoke synthesis, um, focused on synthesis of um, materials for, you know, to test specific hypotheses. Um, so, for example, we might try to design in a toxicity to prove that some particular characteristic is driving that toxicity and then try and, and synthesize it out again. So, so really using our, our synthesis abilities to, to test hypotheses. Um, we also can do chemical and stable isotope labeling of materials. And this is important for ones that have a high background in the environment, for example. So for titania or things like that, where you want to demonstrate that it is your engineered material that you're detecting in a complex mixture. So in, for example, in an environmental sample. Uh, we do quite a bit of method development and protocol development. I'll talk a little bit about that in one of the projects. Um, we focus a lot on the interface between the materials in the biological world. So a lot of interactions with proteins, with small molecules, with natural organic matter and so on to sort of understand how we link from the synthetic identity of the particle through its acquired biological identity and how that then drives interaction and uptake by biological organisms. Uh, we look a lot at the aging of nanomaterials, um, what the so-called provenance that I'll mention later, so how they change during storage, how they change between batches, how they change once the bottle is opened, how they change once we disperse it, how they change once they come into contact with living systems. Um, and related to that, then, we look at fate behavior and the bioenvironmental impact. 
Um, so really, we, the, the image there in the centre shows the Daphnia, which is one of the models we use a lot. It's a sentinel species, its body is transparent, so we can see where the particles are, and we can look at um, both short-term acute and long-term reproductive and even multi-generational experiments using this really nice biological model. Um, in the last while, we've also been focusing a lot on um, on data and data management, and we coordinate a project that focuses on that specifically, which I'll talk about. So that's how we mine the data, how we curate it, how we make it available for reuse, how we make it fair, um, and then how we use it in nanoinformatics. Um, and integrating all of that knowledge, how we use the, the data that we generated and the knowledge that we've generated to promote safe by design and risk governance approaches. Next slide, please. So that's a bit about us as, a, as an organization. But then just to give a little bit of uh, a perspective of where we fit in and where the, um, the nano safety cluster broadly fits into the global nano safety research community. So none of what we're doing, we do on our own. So, um, for example, you see at the top there, there's the nano safety cluster. We have a, a long established uh, EU US partnership, the EU US communities of research. Um, we have a, a legacy of, of previous projects, the um, FP7 and Horizon 2020 projects. We work closely with large infrastructure projects like Elixir and OpenTOX. Uh, we work with international databases and, and data projects like the, the center, the NSF funded Center for Environmental Research into Nanotechnologies. And we link across obviously to OECD working group, um, to the EU Nanomaterials Characterization Lab, and to the Nano Observatory and so on. And then on the right hand side of the slide, Claire, if you click through, you'll see that one of the recent activities that has been going on in the nano safety cluster is a real focus on internationalization. So we've had very recent missions where uh, groups of, of projects have gone to Mexico, where we've gone to um, South Africa, where we've gone to, um, South, to the ASEAN network, to South Korea and to Brazil, and all of those international partnerships are growing and there's strong incentive from each of those regions and countries to engage their scientists, their nanosafety scientists, into EU-funded projects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, did I lose a slide? There was supposed to be a slide on nano, the nanosafety cluster, but anyway, not to worry. Um, this one is showing basically some of the global nano safety challenges. Um, so you'll have heard from Claire already about nano forms. These are um, a new initiative coming from, from ECHA that's sort of identifying that one nanomaterial might have there might be multiple forms of the same core composition of nanomaterials. So the size, the shape, the surface coating, and so on, and how we can use that information to develop grouping strategies and, and read across strategies, um, and how to use that knowledge then to develop safer by design. Um, and areas that are becoming increasingly important on the right-hand side are the development of predictive models. So this is nanoinformatics, it's the adverse outcome pathways, and related to that then, we currently test each of these things individually. So one nanomaterial at a time or one nanomaterial, but not taking into account that it will be co-exposed with a whole range of other chemicals. So looking at mixture effects is uh, an emerging area. And um, so if you click through, you'll see two of the, the trends that I think are some of the most um, important emerging trends. Uh, so one of them is how we correlate in vitro and vivo correlations. And the other is um, this concept of the nanomaterials provenance and aging and transformation. So the nanomaterials provenance is capturing some of the information about how the nanoparticle was made, how it was stored, what conditions it was shipped under, um, how long it's been since the, the sample was opened. So, you know, is there a correlation between when the physchem characterization was done and when the 
biological exposure was done, for example, um, how has the material aged, how has it transformed, and related to that, what's the appropriate transformed version to test. So if the material changes in a product or changes upon release, should we be testing that released form rather than the pristine or, or lab synthesized form, which may have no relation to, um, to what was produced. Um, so this is sort of some of the big challenges that um, the nanosafety cluster is addressing. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, this is the one I was thinking about. So this is sort of just showing um, the, the role of the EU nanosafety cluster, which is very much around integrating and supporting nanosafety research. So I've grouped the projects um, into sort of the phases in which they were funded. So 2015-16 to 2017-18 and the current round, which has only started, so 2019 and 20. And along the bottom, sort of the, the topics that they're covering. So you'll see they're ranging from sort of regulatory support through characterization, through nanoinformatics, through system biology, and then through more sort of support um, so infrastructures. Um, European training networks, et cetera, and the pilot lines. So a lot of projects um, all working on sort of developing our understanding of nano safety. And then um, the more recent rounds then are sort of looking at how we integrate that into governance strategies, into uh, predictive models and IATA, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. I realize I've used my time, so I'll have to go very fast. Um, so ACE Nano Project is a method no, it's fine. project that's it's fine. Just take your time. We've got plenty of time. Obviously, okay. that's relative, okay. not more than five minutes more. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Um, so ACE Nano Project is a H2020 project funded by, uh, sorry, coordinated by my colleague, Eleanor Sammy Jones. And it's really focusing on addressing characterization gaps and making characterization more robust. So it's looking at method innovation, optimization, and benchmarking, and looking at increasing the selectivity of assays, the sensitivity of assays, and the robustness in both native and complex media. And really focusing, um, if you click through again, you'll see the, um, the TRL levels are really focusing on moving methods up, um, up to from TRL three through to TRL six. Uh, next slide. Yeah, there's the TRL levels and then the next slide. So it is um, innovating in a whole range of different areas for analysis. So um, looking at taking the methods and getting them to, to work in complex media, so in, soil, in, in soils and so on. Uh, looking at hyphenating methods so that you can get more information from the same sample and related to that it's looking at harmonization of the sample introduction system so that the input from one instrument is in the right form and the right concentration to go straight into the next instrument. Uh, also extending the range of assays available to us and miniaturizing and simplifying some of the more complex assays. And all of this then has been underpinned by extensive protocols, um, and the data sets showing the validation of the methods. And the idea then is that all of the methods will be supported by a decision tree to help users select which method they need, depending on which question they're answering. And so that decision support tool will then feed through into the, the next slide, please. And you'll see that the overall goal then of um, ACE Nano is to really support users in the selection and application of methods. So you'll see the current toolbox of characterization methods. We have a whole bunch of different methods that do different things. And the output from ACE Nano will be a structured way through those methods. So depending on what um, question you want to answer and what type of material you have in what type of, of system, then the decision tree will guide you through the appropriate characterization methods and the appropriate um, standard operating procedures to use. Next slide, please. So the other project I'm going to present very briefly is Nano Commons. This is a research infrastructure project, and it's really focused very much on the data innovation cycle and optimizing the data and the availability of the data from Horizon 2020 projects. 
Um, and this is there's just a, a quote there. If you click through once more, you'll see there's a, a quote from the Danish um, from Denmark where they've they've done a calculation that if even 50% of their research data was made open, there'd be enormous socioeconomic benefits from that. Um, and that's a sort of a conservative estimate of the, the value of making their data fair. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, next slide, please. So in Nano Commons, we are working um, very strongly to, to sort of drive this data-driven innovation. So we're looking at the whole life cycle of data from the planning of an experiment through the acquisition, through the manipulation and the analysis, storage and, and FAIR, making the data reusable. So you know, to make to develop models and to make decisions, regulatory and industry, you need to have high quality data. Um, and the way to get high quality data is to plan the experiments carefully, make sure that you have the appropriate metadata, and we're really pushing to incorporate data management into the data generation step. So rather than it being something you do at the end of the project, it's something you do at the start. Next slide, please. I think we're almost at the end. Um, this one is just sort of showing the structure of it. So we take the large data sets, we standardize the curation format, we allow databases to speak to each other, so we're not replicating the data, but we're communicating with the data and then using that in all sorts of, of models and approaches and really trying to promote harmonization, data comparability and interoperability through FAIR data. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just showing how we're doing it. So um, using a, an approach called semantic interoperability and making a semantic map. And this is where things like ontologies um, come in, they're very important. So that's a harmonized language and harmonized relationships um, that allow us to take quite different data sets and integrate them so that all of the data can be combined and used in models. Next slide, please. Um, and then, as I said, NanoCommons is a research infrastructure, which means that the tools that are being developed are available to the whole community for access. So you can apply for funded access, or as the tools become more robust, they're then offered as services that people can just use without needing any expertise help. So the tools are, as I talked about already, the experimental workflows, design and implementation, so how you manage data from the outset, uh, data processing and management tools, data visualization tools and predictive toxicology, and um, data storage and analysis. So we're already working with a number of other projects, but we're also open to anyone who has data or anyone who has a challenge that they would like um, a, a model solution for. Uh, I think that's it. Next slide, please, if there is one. Oh yes, this is just our, our network of partnerships. So again, even just through the Nano Commons and ACE Nano projects and Nano Solve It, which I didn't talk about, uh, which is a, one of the informatics projects, we have a very wide network of partners and collaborators globally, which we are leveraging for things like um, round robins on the methods that we're developing, but also round robins then on some of the models that we're developing. Um, and again, that's in line with the, the Horizon 2020 ethos of international collaboration. Okay, um, one last slide, I think, might be just the thank yous. Um, and that's, yeah, just to say thank you for your attention. We're happy to collaborate and to answer questions. And there is a, a QR code there if you would like to, to tell us some of your needs so that we can begin to address them through the research infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Isolt. And I particularly enjoyed your on-point references to 1980s pop groups at the start there. <laughs> Showing our age. So that was a really good presentation to show. I mean, there was a lot of information squished into a presentation. But it shows the necessity of not only what the, how you build structured decision-making into assessment of safety, so that you can have confidence in the assays that you have selected to do and the data that you're going to get out. And when you refer to data as well, it's not only what you have done in your research, it's how available is it and what critical mass can you build between data. So that's a huge progression that we've seen through the nano safety cluster and projects such as nano commons in you know, 
working really hard to support the development of predictive modeling through ex access to high quality data. And there's no getting away that that is an absolutely essential component of successful safety research. So I'd say thanks very much again to the Birmingham team. And I'm now going to introduce Nick Quirk from his airport in Copenhagen, hopefully. If you want to say hi, Nick. Hello. Unmute yourself. Hi. I Hello, everyone. Go and put yeah. your slides on. Hopefully you can see those in front of you now. I can, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so should I start? Yes, please take it away, Nick. That would be great. Okay. Well, first, let me just very briefly introduce myself. I'm Nick Quirk. I'm Professor of Chemical Physics um, at um, <clears throat> Imperial College in London. <clears throat> uh, Imperial College is um, normally in the top 10 universities, ranked in the top 10 universities in the world. We have um, huge research support from research councils in the EU, as well as a very significant support from industry. Um, so my role today is not really to talk about my group or my research, but to talk about an EU project which we participate in called Smart Nanotox. And I want to just give you an overview of the project, uh, what we're doing, and what we hope to deliver. So uh, Smart Nanotox is an interdisciplinary 10-country EU project. And <clears throat> our focus is on trying to predict whether or not nanomaterials um, <clears throat> can harm the, the human body, but in particular through inhalation. Now, there's a huge literature, which is impossible just for its magnitude to read in its entirety, uh, with all sorts of um, claims about possible harmful effects of nanomaterials. And to distinguish that, from colloidal materials and dusts and so on, which we've known about for 100 years. The new thing now is that nanomaterials, uh, because of their size, um, can have properties that are different to the bulk material. So you think you might have uh, gold, which is normally inert, but if you, if you make it very small, you make it you know, five nanometer, two nanometers in size, then the chemistry can change. And that's the same for all materials. The electrons behave differently, you've essentially got different materials. So when you're dealing with nanomaterials, you're dealing with a new class of materials and you need to know whether or not they're going to cause harm if you breathe them in or if they're in the environment. So <clears throat> there is, of course, a risk associated with nanomaterials if they're behaving, not behaving normally. But also, on the other side, there could be opportunity for drug delivery and, and therapy. Though our project is focused uh, on, the, on the risk. Are they toxic? We want to know if they're toxic, if inhaled. Are they linked to adverse outcomes like inflammation, cancer, cardiovascular problems? And we're particularly keen to develop a pathway. We want to know the details of how this harmful effect uh, starts and is, uh, is mediated through the body and linked to the adverse outcome. And the adverse outcomes would be those uh, defined by the OECD uh, to which we are contributing. So one of the project uh, deliverables is a new set of um, adverse outcome pathways based on key uh, molecular events. So uh, yeah, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> As I said, it's a European project, so we have contributions from Dublin, from Finland, from France, uh, Stockholm, Germany. I hope I haven't missed anybody out. Denmark in particular, because I'm in Denmark at the moment, having just been to a project meeting. Next slide, please. We have a very wide range of expertise. So we have people doing in vivo experiments on rats and mice. We have people doing in vitro experiments, trying to make the correlation between in vitro and in vivo in the hope that one could reduce the use of animals uh, and also do tests more quickly. We have people working in silica. So people like me doing molecular modeling, um, 
uh, and we have people right at the other end of the scale, we have pathologists working with us. So we're doing installation, we're doing pathology, we're doing uptake measurements, we're doing accumulation measurements, we're doing uh, uh, signaling measurements, dynamics. Uh, we have uh, systems biologists. So a whole range of different disciplines which we hope or we, we're working to integrate to provide um, um, well-defined outputs. So part of the challenge in the in the uh, project is to learn to talk to each other across the different disciplines and across the different length scales. Next slide, please. Uh, so it's it's truly interdisciplinary research. Fourteen different disciplines, and we're going from molecules to medicine stroke toxicity, and it's a pathway based approach. We want to make a, an explanation of an adverse outcome based on the links between the nanomaterials properties and the key initiating events, which could be molecular. So we go from that to an adverse outcome pathway, which is nothing more than a set of linked events that goes from uh, A all the way through to B, where B is the adverse outcome. We seek an explanation based on molecular level interactions between nanomaterials and membranes with a molecular level key initiating event leading to an adverse outcome, which um, would be some sort of uh, obviously problem like uh, cancer or uh, inf uh, chronic inflammation and the, the, one of the key outputs is to capture this in software that correlates the nanomaterials properties their physical chemical properties with the toxicity and properties could be uh, size shape uh, it could be um, uh, all sorts of other ch chemical properties, uh, zeta potentials, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm not going to go into any detail, but the idea is we input the properties of the nanomaterial and we output some sort of measure of its likely toxicity. This is the, the end point of the project. Next slide, please. So this slide uh, can you keep pushing it so the pictures come up that's right yeah so this slide um, just emphasizes that uh, in order to get from the nanomaterials properties to the uh, key events that initiate the adverse outcome pathway we're of course doing uh, experiments uh, in vitro and in, uh, in vivo but we're also doing molecular level modeling uh, which can be classical or ab initio modeling of events at the bio nano interface and we hope through that understanding to generate quantitative structure property relationships um, that would then be able to predict the adverse outcomes uh, next slide please here's an example of a toxicity pathway which would link an adverse outcome to a molecular level property. So let's imagine that we're um, in a railway station and we're inhaling diesel particulates from a, um, a horrible diesel train. <clears throat> so they go into the lung, they get covered in protein, and then the lung starts to try and clear them away. So we get uh, phagosomes eating these protein uh, covered uh, nanoparticles. Now, Normally, if they're clearing normal debris, then that would they would take it away, so clear the lungs. However, if it's nanoparticle, it may well be more persistent, or it could be a fiber, by the way. And when I say particle, don't imagine that it has to be round. It could be uh, an asbestos fiber or uh, uh, a long nanotube or something like that. Um, so it comes in covered in corona, but the lysosomes will create an acidic environment which could dissolve the corona away so it takes the protein covering off exposing the nanomaterial underneath which might be carbon nanotube it might be an oxide particle and this uh, surface this nano surface would then start to interfere with the lysosome membrane by absorbing lipids from that membrane if the membrane is sufficiently disrupted 
is going to kill the, uh, the cell and release pro-inflammatory mediators or cause something called frustrated phagocytosis, uh, which will lead to the release of uh, other factors, which will uh, start an inflammation. And if we get in persistent inflammation, then we can get silicosis, lung cancer, autoimmune diseases, a whole range of horrible things. The key point here is that the molecular initiating event is the um, absorption of lipids from the membrane, totally disrupting it. So um, part of our effort is in trying to predict whether that is going to happen. Um, and then we incorporate that into some adverse outcome pathway. So uh, next slide, please. So what are the outputs of the project? What do we hope to um, leave you with in uh, under a year's time? Well, uh, one very important uh, outcome would be the correlation between well-designed in vitro experiments with the in vivo results for toxicity. So that would be the instruments, but it would also be the methods, the procedures, the data. Um, the next very significant outcome would be a method of predicting toxicity based on particular physical properties. Uh, this would be a piece of software, uh, which would be available to companies um, wishing to develop new material, new nanomaterials. And this could al allow, at an early stage, go, no go decisions, uh, influencing materials selection and development. So uh, you can just imagine how much money one could save or time, effort or disasters one could avoid uh, if this was available. Now, we have very clear routes to market. So the in vitro experiment uh, instruments, methods, procedures, that's handled by vitro cell. And the uh, toxicity predictions based on particular physical properties will be handled by uh, DASOL through DASOL systems. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the uh, DASO system uh, uh, group would take our quantitative structure property models and then turn them into a commercial software, um, providing, for example, a web service where you could upload your material properties and then apply the code. Um, they can provide consulting and they can provide a software package which you could buy. So this would enable you to um, filter out harmful materials from your product development. Next slide, please. A vitro cell, cell instruments and expertise. And uh, so it's very, very important if you're doing in vitro experiments to be able to control very carefully the way you deliver the nanomaterials to the cells and then the way you measure the uh, response. And so, they have developed an aerosol exposure system, which we are using within the project. And at the moment, various parts of this are available. The um, aerosol exposure system is commercially available. The protocols are available and the training materials um, uh, are, um, should be actually available now. There's um, a nicely developed timeline for um, increasing the uh, what's available. So being able to measure the deposition of the nanoparticles is extremely important. We need to know exactly how much per unit area is delivered, and that will be um, supplied through vitro cells. So you can see all of the uh, things that we that they will be delivering and, and the time scale. So I think that concludes, um, is that the last slide there? Yes. Ah. No, okay. Almost, yeah, okay. So this is the last slide. And uh, if you want to know more, there's a brochure of which you can um, obtain from uh, Vladimir Labaskin, who is the project coordinator based in UCD. There's a website. And um, so Vladimir or, uh, or any of us would be happy uh, to help you if you need to know more about the project. So, uh, yeah, so that's me. Uh, done, Claire, thank you very much for hosting me.
No, thanks very much indeed, Nick. And well done for finding a quiet enough spot in an airport to do that. I think that might be a world first. <laughs> okay. So, so shall I mute myself? Yes, that would be great if you could. And you can me now leave okay. to crash your plane. Okay, thanks. Bye. Thanks, Nick. I think that shows us, uh, it gives a really good example of how industrial pipelines for safety research outcomes are developing, particularly as you have two pre-existing companies there who are adapting their business models to expand into addressing nanomaterials. So and I think that's we will see increasing amounts of that as sa uh, safety research provides enough scientific certainty and regulatory connections to allow companies to start investing in providing services in that area. And it's something that we will see more of as we move through. So I would like now to introduce our next presenter from the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health. Well, I just go and fetch their slides. Do you want to introduce yourself, uh, T? And hopefully you can see the slides OK on your screen. Yes, thank you, Claire. Super. Uh, I guess it's the slides. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm Anna Kasavietanen from Finnish Institute of Occupational Health, and I'm the special specialist research scientist. And me and our team in in Nana Safety has prepared this uh, presentation for today. So uh, we can get started. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, so I have a few words about the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health first. So uh, we are specialized in well-being at work and we carry out research and provide services and training uh, in, in, in subjects related to occupational health and safety and also related to engineered nanoparticles and nanomaterials. And next one. And Finnish Institute of Occupational Health is an independent research institute, partly funded by the public. And we have approximately 500 workers around Finland and about 20 people who are working with the nano safety. Yes, next one. So, um, Here's an illustration of uh, different factors of the occupational health and safety. So for the risk assessment, we need to have a toxicological hazard assessment and also a human exposure assessment. And when we combine these, we'll get a risk assessment. And after we have the risk assessment, we are able, uh, uh, we can use that for the occupational risk management. And for that, uh, we of course need uh, different appropriate risk control methods, but it also includes the training and education of the workers and the relevant regulations and guidance related. And next one. Okay, great. Uh, so let's take a closer look at, at all of all of these uh, factors and start with the toxilo toxicological hazard assessment and what we do at the FIOH around this topic. So next one, please. So um, today there is still a huge gap between new available nanoproducts and the existing information on their risks for human health. Uh, we know that the nanomaterials are similar to normal chemicals in that some of them may be toxic and some may not. So they are not like a homogeneous group of uh, substances. Uh, since nanomaterials have an enhanced surface reactivity compared with the bulk material, they may have also stronger adverse effects. And it has also been postulated that nanomaterials could easily move within the body and accumulate in cells and tissues and then uh, interfere with some key molecules, for example, proteins. Okay, the next one. So what we are doing at the FIOA 8, 
with uh, toxicology assessment. So as part of the hazard assessment, people perform toxicological studies using both in vitro and in vivo approaches. And we have a, also a long, long experience on the human biomonitoring assessment of populations exposed to chemicals. This is something that could be also applied to the nanomaterials exposures. Our main, main expertise, expertise is, is in uh, genetic toxicology, which allows the identification of carcinogens that operate by including damage in the genome. Assessment of the ability of a substance to induce a genotoxic effects is part of the required information under REACH and also CLP. However, uh, some of the existing test guidelines may not be adequate for testing of nanomaterials. So therefore, we are also involved in a couple of initiatives to adopt some genotoxicity assays for testing nanomaterials. They are strongly linked to other current efforts on characterizing, characterizing nanomaterials in biological media and how to measure the uptake by cells and tissues. In line also with the regulatory requirements which promote the use of alternative methods, we are developing in vitro cocal cultures that could mimic the response in animal lungs. And we are also involved in the development of computing models that will allow faster assessment of new materials and, and products. So next slide, please. And next I have uh, an example, what we have done in this field um, related to nanofibrillated celluloses. So this is something that has been studied in several projects so far. Um, and these nanofibrillated uh, celluloses are innovative materials uh, which have a quite high importance here in Nordic countries. Not only of their broad range of applications, but especially because of their sustainable and renewable nature. Uh, in addition, as their production is still in early stage, they offer huge possibilities of adopting safe by design approaches, which we are trying to do in these projects. Okay, uh, next one. So the main concern about the nanofibrillated cellulose is that they are high aspect ratio fibers with a prolonged biopersistence in the body. Characteristics that resemble the other fibers, like uh, asbestos, that have been shown to be carcinogenic. So that's why there's a lot of uh, interest to study these fibers. What we have found out uh, so far is that they can induce an inflammatory response that seems to be resolved after some time, but uh, some of them seem to be able to induce genetic damage for longer time. Unfortunately, the current in vitro assays don't seem to predict all the effects that we see in experimental animals, so there's still work to be done. Yes, the next one. And then I would like to show you how this sort of a hazard assessment can be put into a practice. And a few years ago, we participated in a project called Scaffold, which was also a EU project. Um, and the project was an occupational, about an occupational risk management of nanomaterials in the construction industry. The aim was to provide a practical tools and guidance for the industry. And, and as a result of the project, some health-based occupational exposure limits were proposed uh, based on toxicity review. And the next one, please. So now we can move to the human exposure assessment, which is uh, another important part of, of FIOH activities in the field of nanosafety. Um, the aim of the human exposure assessment is to find out how, the what, and for which concentrations workers are exposed to. So if there are uh, nanomaterials 
and if, if the workers are exposed and 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 what is the concentration and what should we do about it and things like that. Yes. So the uh, occupies or exposure to NCNET nanoparticles may uh, occur via inhalation, dermal absorption, and digestion. Uh, it is known today that the inhalation is the main route, and that's why that's why we are concentrating mainly on that when we are doing the the exposure assessment. And for reliable exposure assessment, we need to measure the concentration of the uh, nanoparticles from the air in actual work environment. Okay, let's take a look at it a little bit closer. So how we do it in practice is that we start by collecting a conceptual information, meaning what kind of nanomaterials they, they are using, also, what other chemicals they are, uh, what kind of processes are involved, and working manners, and so on. So, we will co collect collect this kind of in information before we can start planning at of the uh, actual measurements. So, if we find out in this first stage that it is possible that some workers may expose to nanoparticles, then some measurements need to be done. And, and the, the measurements of the nanoparticles, uh, we need to do it in, in different steps and from different locations. So we need to need to measure the breeding zone of the worker. Also, the working station concentration is often measured. And what is really important is to measure the background, because nanoparticles are actually everywhere. They are coming from the nature, from traffic, from from processes from everywhere, and we need to find a way to separate the background particles from the NCNET nanoparticles. So that's why we need we, we need to know our background and also the process particles really well. And in addition, we will also measure the conditions like like temperature and humidity and and things like this this in the work environment. We also do observation at the workplace to know what is happening and when and how the work is done and when the nanomaterials nano are um, handled and so on. And when we combine all this information, next one please, we get an exposure assessment. Okay, we can move on. So now we have the toxicological hazard assessment covered and also the human exposure assessment. And when we comp combine this information, we get the health risk assessment. And we can take a look at some examples about this. Next one, please. Yes. So, uh, our expertise on, on risk assessment has been applied also in, in different projects like Kinamox or Nanorec, and also for risk, assess, risk assessment uh, it is something that we try to do with the computer models as well and different tools so that that we don't need to do the measurements. That's why all kind of modeling and, and uh, tools are being developed. It. And we have comp contributed to the develop de development of these tools and worked in several projects on establishing criteria for assessing data quality, building up decision trees for assessing genotoxicity and, and contributing to grouping and read across approaches and, and things like that. Uh, the use of the risk assessment tools are um, designed to help the industry in their risk assessment. So, sort of an important part of, of our efforts as well. Okay, the next one, please. So, uh, at last, we are ready to take a look at the occupational risk management, which, which uh, will be done after we have the risk assessment. 
and the risk assessment shows us what kind of actions needs to be done uh, to ensure the health and safety of the workers. So we can take a look at the different possibilities. First of all, as I already pointed out, the hazards of the different nanomaterials is not known. So this is why a precautionary principle is followed with nanomaterials and the target is exposure minimization. So for the exposure minimization, there are plenty of different actions that can be applied. Next one. And I have some ex examples here. So, so first of all, the risk management should follow the order of, order of starting from substitution, then reduction, segregation, preve prevention of dispersion, avoidance of the exposure, and then finally, at, at the re really, really last thing to do should be the personal protective equipment. But all these uh, different um, actions can can be um, applied to, to, for example, material or the chemical. For example, we can replace or substitute the powder phase material with the liquid phase and make it more uh, safer for the employee or the workers. Then we can we can concentrate on on the process itself. We can segregate it by by putting an enclosure to a machine that is is, is allowing the nano, nanoparticles to evaporate or release in the air or segregate the, the operations from other parts of the uh, work. We can influence on working manners so so we can add, add some automation or here use a personal protective, protective equipment and all, or as a last option we can also influence on the work environment for example uh, utilization of control rooms to avoid it, the uh, exposure so there are plenty of different ways to manage the risks and as an expert, as an consults, we try to provide the best solution for each case in our project and for our customers as well. Okay, next one. So there's a, one example um, uh, what we are doing in the field of uh, risk management. Uh, at the moment, we are involved in the industrial development project called NECOMADA, which is also a Horizon 2020 project. The objectives of the, of the project is to deliver customized electronic inks and adhesives for the purposes of printed electronics. And here our role is to implement the safe by design approach to ensure that the occupational safety is, is uh, taking into account in the development chain. So from the very beginning of the material development all the way to the end user markets. And so, so we will ensure that every phase of the production will be safe for the workers. And also we will offer some guidance and good practices for the partners related to safety. Okay, next one, please. So, what is the future of the nano research at the FIO uh, In future, we are continuing our contribution on data management and development of tools through new projects as nanoinformatics. And we are also taking part of the new project NanoRico on the risk governance of nanomaterials. Uh, we are targeting our results to topics such as safe by design approaches, safety on biomaterials and development of uh, new assays for asset assessment. Yes, okay, next one please. 
So, a few words about the dissemination. We contribute actively to the dissemination of uh, nanosafety issues, not only through scientific papers. Next one, please. But also through the publication of fact sheets, and, and we also participate in different international courses and, and also uh, train and educate by ourselves for the for the um, different actors in the field of um, nano engineering and and nano safety. Yes, the next one. And here's our team with the contact details. So we have uh, exposure assessment and workplace safety, toxicology assessment, risk assessment and occupational exposure limits and risk management and governance covered in our team. Yes, thank you. Thanks very much indeed for an extremely comprehensive uh, presentation. And it's, it's always very interesting to note the diversity of different types of organizations that take part in um, nano safety research. So by using uh, you know, an, essentially an, an occupational health center, it focuses on uh, national priorities, such as the focus on the uh, nanocellulose, which is really interesting. Uh, and it also helps Europe and indeed wider countries to bring national specialities into a much larger international uh, conversation. So that's extremely useful for standards development as well as and, and as projects such as the Malta project uh, demonstrates, you bring a lot of national folk priorities into an international research setting. So thanks very much there indeed for that. So we're going to move on to our last presenter of the day uh, from Vito, but I'm going to first ask the Vito team who would like the screen as we are going to hand over to you guys? And I don't see Sandra on the line. Hi, uh, it's uh, Sven Verkouter. We are following on my uh, laptop. Super, that's Good great. Afternoon. Thanks. I'm now going to hand over the screen to Sven, who is right at the bottom of my list. And hopefully we will see that transferred over to you immediately. Sure. Okay. Super. Super. I see very well. Thanks very much indeed, Sven. Okay. Now it's up to Sandra. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sandra Verstraal. Uh, my background is on the safety testing of uh, chemicals and nanomaterials using alternative uh, in vitro methods. Uh, Sandra, can and I just with my... Sandra, can I just interrupt? Say your slides are not in presentation mode. Are you going to? Uh, oh, sorry. That's fine. Thank you very much. Is it fine? Okay. That's perfect. So uh, we prepared uh, some slides uh, together with my colleagues here, uh, Evelyn Frens and uh, Sven Verkouteren. Uh, safe innovation with materials in industrial settings. So uh, VITO is the Flemish Institute for Technological Research with its headquarters in Mol, Belgium. Uh, it's funded for one third by the Flemish government. Uh, we have some uh, activities organized in five teams on sustainable chemistry, land use, health, energy and materials. Uh, we are part of the health team, just working on health. Um, VITO counts around 900 employees uh, of 39 nationalities and we have around some 92 dogs and dogs. On uh, this slide, you can see the nano activities of VITO, uh, which are embedded in the different teams. And we focus on health and safety, on characterization and identification, on nano diagnostics, and on design and synthesis. Uh, our units on health, we uh, work on the three first pillars of uh, the nano portfolio. On the uh, left hand side, you can see uh, our website, so more, more information can be found on uh, that website as well. This slide gives some uh, projects uh, where we are part of. Um, these are FP7, 2020 projects, some 
Flemish funded projects and so on. Some are finished, some are uh, still uh, running, but it gives you a flavor of our nano activities in uh, international projects. Uh, the topic of this presentation is safe innovation with nanomaterials in industrial settings. So the drivers for safe innovation are emerging technologies like, you know, nanotechnology. So uh, uncertain risk and uncertain technologies give some public concern. And it's important to clarify the safety issues on this technology. So um, this is a busy slide, but Safe by design can be integrated into an industrial innovation process. It's just important that um, safety issues, that they are already um, tackled during the R&D and design phases instead of doing some testing when a product is already on the market. So it's important to, when you start a project that you go from uncertainty and risks towards certainty and management. So that's, that's a bit of principle of safe innovation. And this principle we applied in two uh, projects. On the left-hand side, you can see in Horizon 2020 nanotuned pilot project started in 2015. In this project, we uh, developed some nanomaterials for metal additive manufacturing to make some compounds for aircraft instruments. Uh, on the right hand side, it's uh, the metalling project, it's the Flemish project. And here uh, we develop uh, some inks, uh, silver inks for, for printing metallic conductors to be used in uh, sensors. And below you can see the different partners uh, who are involved in both projects. So these case studies uh, will now be uh, shown in the next slides. So how we applied uh, safe by design um, process in these projects. So here is a brief overview of the different steps of uh, safe by design. So starting with the identification of nanomaterials, uh, then you have exposure and hazard assessment, and uh, at the end you have uh, risk, and risk assessment and risk management. So uh, the next slides uh, will focus on each topic uh, separately with some uh, examples. So for the nanomaterial identification, so uh, for this one, uh, this was in our case mainly done by our industrial partners in the projects. Uh, but on the right hand side, uh, you can see some pictures of um, instruments we have available at FIPO to do nanomaterial identification and characterization. So to have an idea on the shape, the dimensions, the size, and so on. So that's the first important step when you start uh, your identification of your materials. Then the next step is the exposure assessment. Uh, so for this, we can check first uh, some literature and we can do some exposure modeling. Uh, then an an another important part is that we go on site to our uh, partners and that we um, check the different activities that are taking place in the project. Um, this means that we describe an exposure scenario. On the right hand side, you can see a table. And these are the different things we take into account when describing a certain uh, activity. So we describe which activity is taking place, then we look to the technical measures and the operational conditions that are uh, on site, like uh, we check for uh, the availability of fume cupboards, local exhaust ventilation, and so on. Uh, then we ask uh, the personnel which protective equipment is um, is used for these activities. Um, then we also check if there is release to surface water to soil or to air. And then instantly we can uh, give some recommendations of uh, these uh, activities. Um, but uh, in certain cases we can 
to simulate some activities in uh, test chambers here at FITO. And uh, at the next slide, uh, and, uh, and other part of exposure assessment is to do the real measurements. So here you can see some pictures at our partner uh, of uh, Nanotune uh, during different activities like being uh, high kinetic processing, hot isostatic pressure, for example. And then we have some devices, some mobile devices and some stationary equipment which we use to measure uh, exposure during the activity. And the same was done in the other projects. Um, here you can see a react reaction vessel for the production of silver nanoparticle paste. Um, in red, uh, you can see uh, our instruments and our uh, filters and sampling inlets. And then uh, right, you can see that um, by um, measuring these um, nanoparticle concentrations and particle mass, you can uh, it can give you some time profiles. And uh, you can see a lot of peak profiles, and then this can be related to the different activities during, for example, here the silver nanoparticle based production. So, uh, besides uh, the exposure assessment, uh, we also do some laser testing in house here at VITO. Um, we uh, do some toxicity testing according to OECD test guidelines, like uh, beneath you can see the daphnia and uh, the algae. Um, for the human part, we look for three important exposure routes. Uh, we look for eye, for eye exposure, for skin exposure, and um, also for uh, lung uh, exposure. Uh, for eye testing, uh, we work uh, with uh, OECD test guidelines. Uh, we follow a tiered approach where we combine uh, BCOP, this um, bovine corneal opacity and permeability test, together with 3D uh, corneal models. Uh, it gives us an idea on uh, different categories of eye uh, irritation. Then uh, the next step is on skin irritation and skin corrosion, also done using 3D models according to OECD guidelines. And then the third one is on uh, inhalation testing, but for this there are no OECD uh, guidelines or alternative um, regulatory accepted guidelines available yet. And this is uh, also part of FITO's uh, research, uh, it's one of our research topics. So on the next slide, it's just to show um, that um, now in innovation testing is mainly done in P4, it's regulatory accepted, but we want uh, to go uh, for an uh, alternative vitro method. Uh, we already made a shift from a submerge classical uh, testing methods uh, where um, compounds are exposed in the liquid to the and we now work um, in a, a more realistic way uh, by air liquid interface uh, exposure. So this means the cells are grown on an insert and they are exposed uh, to an aerosol uh, and the aerosol uh, consists of a few nanomaterial which you want to test. And to do these experiments, you need, of course, some uh, infrastructure to measure this. So we have uh, two commercial systems of vitro cell. On, uh, on the left side, you can see a small base model. And then in the middle, we have one uh, obtained from beta. It's a big uh, system to do uh, those uh, response testing. And um, another part is uh, the, on the right, you can see a system which we uh, co-developed together with uh, Partner Plus in an FP7 project. Uh, and the proof of principle of uh, that um, device is published uh, in environmental science and technology. And there is also a patent pending for uh, this device. So uh, for inhalation testing, uh, we want to bring these alternative methods also to yeah, regulatory accepted method together with uh, industrial partners. Then um, after uh, exposure and hazard, uh, you can combine these data uh, to do a risk 
treatments. So you uh, can compare the exposure values with available exposure limits or nano reference values. And for risk management, uh, you can you can give us uh, some recommendations for the safe use. So an example of risk assessment here, uh, which we did in the Nanotune project, is that we calculated the risk index. So uh, we did some exposure measurements on site at our partner uh, facilities. So we had an idea on the different activities and the number concentration and the particle masses. And then we compared that value with uh, nano operational exposure limits, and then we uh, we can get a risk index. If uh, the risk index is below one, that's okay, and then it's safe, and you don't need to do some action. But uh, below on the table, you can see for titanium dioxide during one activity, we uh, were below the uh, uh, risk index. We had one of two point two. So this means that you need to take some action. So uh, you need to take some measures to reduce uh, this risk below. Uh, um, the next slide. Wait a second. Yes. Step five is risk management. Um, we were involved in Nano Risk Project, and in that project, a technical guide was uh, written to assist manufacturers and users of nanomaterials in the selection of risk measure management measures. And you can find this document uh, by using the link on uh, this slide. So it can be useful. And also at VITO, we have a protocol. We have a protocol on how to handle safely with nanomaterials. In our projects with uh, industrial partners, we share this protocol to give an idea how we deal with uh, nanomaterials in a safe way. And you can see some examples here on the sheet. So for every lab where we work with nanomaterials, we have at the entrance a lab sheet. On that sheet is shown that we work with nanos in that um, lab. So there is also restricted entrance. Only personnel who uh, follow a course on handling of nanomaterials can enter that room. Uh, you also see uh, the label, which is shown on, uh, on the lab sheet, but also on all um, jars that we use for nanomaterials. Also important is on the sheet that you can see which personal protective equipment is needed for the room. Um, the jar in jar principle is used, so this means that your nanoparticles are put into a second uh, bag or in a second jar, uh, so it's uh, double packed. And also for storage, we also put uh, the nano hazard label on, on our storage cabinets, and it's also a jar principle that we apply. Then, um, thing is that we in the protocol we also uh, show that we have we use the decision tree to see which measures we need to take uh, for which activities so um, we have three different, different risk levels for our nanomaterials going from nano one to nano three and de depending on, on which nano risk you have you need to take less or more measures so here is uh, zoom in. So this is an activity um, with nanomaterials where we use nanofibers. And then if we use dry nanofibers, then the risk class is nano three. When we use the nanofibers in matrix with no release, then it's nano one. And then uh, after we know which risk class we are in, then we have to check some tables. Uh, on the next slide, you can see uh, one of these tables. We have one for technical measures. We have one for personal protective equipment, for maintenance, and for organization. So here, on the technical measures, you can see uh, things on ventilation, on the access, uh, a passageway, or the vacuum that's used or not. And then, if your nano is in the nano three category, Right hand side, you can see more crosses, so you need to take more measures when working with these materials. 
So this is uh, our last slide. You can see here all people of Vito working on nano activities. Uh, more information can be found on our dedicated website. You can find it below on this slide. And yeah, that's, uh, it. that's it. So if there are uh, some questions, we are happy uh, to answer them. Thanks very much indeed, indeed, Sandra. And that was a really excellent presentation. Because it, it highlighted a number of different points that we see we didn't see in the earlier presentations in that, you know, for example, it highlighted that you there are always innovation potentials come from advancements in nano safety. So you have developed novel equipment, which is now being developed commercially. And that, of course, will make a big difference to um, the ability for external organizations to access better nano safety assessments. And it also shows as well, you talked a lot, particularly in your final slides, around the decision trees that you have in terms of employee exposure to nanomaterials during processing. And of course, that's not just for nanomaterial, nanomaterial producers, but also for those using nanomaterials in um, creating nano-enabled products. So those organizations and these companies in particular may never have developed or worked with nanomaterials before, but they need to have the confidence to bring those into a working environment where their own employees may be exposed. And this is something where we certainly see in NIA the biggest bottlenecks in confidence through the value chain for nanomaterials and nano-enabled products is going from um, it's going from nanomaterial producers into nanomaterial users. And so safety assessments like this really help to give confidence to decide to include nanomaterials into products that you are developing. So I would like to say thank you once again. We have crashed perfectly into the end of our webinar time for today. So we can't go into a Q&A session right now. However, we will share the recording of this with everybody that attended and with who they, that registered. And if you are a near member, you will also get the slides from this. We welcome all feedback on the webinar. And I would just like to thank our four speakers once again for their time and efforts into providing an extremely diverse insight into how nano safety is researched and implemented. So I'd like to say thank you very much to everybody. You've earned your late afternoon cup of coffee or early morning cup of coffee, wherever you may be. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thanks once again. <laughs>